So today we are here and we are going to be hearing about sustainable farming practices, which farmer Walt uses on Walmart Holsteins. With us are Luke Trice, who is the crop manager, and then Chase Mitchell, who is our service manager for Walmart Holsteins to talk about the processes of sand reclaiming and manure separation, as well as their roles on the farm. So I'm gonna transfer this over to you. Awesome. I am really excited to hear more about this. So if you didn't hear what she said, she said sand reclaiming. So we're going to learn about the sustainability process of how they actually reuse sand on their farm. And we're going to get to hear from Luke and Chase about this experience on the farm. So we're really excited. Um, so I am going to, I believe they're ready. So I'm going to pass it over to one of them. I'm not sure who, who's up, but go ahead guys and, and take it away. But yes, uh, yeah, I'm Chase, this is Luke. Uh, we're talking about sustainability and um, I guess we're going to dive right into it. I was kind of talking to them while we were kind of switching the camera around a little bit, but we're going to dive into sand reclamation. Um, so here at the farm, and you probably saw it when you walked down, a uh, bunch of piles of sand around here. Um, and what we do with the sand is we basically reclaim about 70% of the sand that uh, is used for the bedding. Um, and what it does is it comes down through our flush lane uh, with manure and uh, we take it out of there. And as the group is coming down through, you probably saw that big green machine over there with a hopper on it. Um, what we do is we put it in there. That's a sand shaker. It uh, basically shakes all the water out of it, makes it a little drier. And uh, from there, uh, it's a pretty complicated step. We make a big pile of it right over here. And then we uh, move that pile over to a pile over here. And we let that sit for about six weeks. Um, we found that that helps uh, kill off uh, the majority of the bacteria that likes to grow manure and, with the sand. And then after it's sat in that pile for about six weeks, we like to move it out in these little ricks during the summertime and when the weather's fair. And we roll it back and forth to uh, dry it down. And uh, once it's dried down, then we'll scoop it all back up and we put it back into our barns um, up here. And that's what the cows are bedded with. So the sustainable part about this is we're not pulling in a bunch of sand um, throughout the year because it's about 10 triaxle loads of sand a week, which is what, 200 tons, Luke, 200 tons of sand a week. So if we had to truck all that in, that'd be coming out of a quarry somewhere. Um, not to say that we don't get new sand in because we can't save 100% of it. So what we do use new sand for is uh, for our calving areas. And we also have a pen to, for hospital cows and uh, we could use this sand. It's perfectly good for using for that, but we like to use uh, brand new sand for uh, new life and to uh, get those cows that aren't doing so hot a little bit better. <clears throat> uh, with the sand reclamation, so all the sand comes down our flush lane and that has a lot to do with our uh, manure system here at the farm. So all of our barns here are flush barns. So if you can see the cow towers that are all around, they're painted like cows doesn't have milk in it, it actually has manure in it. So basically uh, when the groups are getting milked, guys go through, they'll shovel the pens out a little bit and then the barn is like a big toilet. So they flush that barn and basically all the manure comes down, comes through the flush lane down here and into, into our separator building, which is behind us here. Um, and when it goes through the separator, it separates the solids from the liquids. And those are the two types of manure that we have here at the farm. So the liquids will either get pumped back up to the barn so that uh, they can flush again, or it will overflow down to these lagoons, which we have three of. And there's about 8 million gallons worth of storage here at the farm. So there's 8 million gallons worth of storage of manure here. Um, and typically during the spring and fall time, we get hot and heavy about uh, emptying those lagoons out. And some of the practices we use to do that is uh, drag lining. And we also tank manure, which we have a tank and a tractor sitting over here. That's one of the vessels we use to uh, get all the manure out to the fields um, to add nutrients back to the soil. Um, we also have solid manures, which is coming out of this building over here. That's what's separated off the liquid. Uh, we also have some bee spreaders running around here, but I didn't get a chance to clean one up. So I don't have one sitting here. Um, and with the, yeah, with the, with the drag lining process, 
Um, what we like to do uh, uh, close here to the farm, it's cool with this on this farm, we actually have a mile worth of pipe buried underground, which we can tag into different fields up the road here and also here at the main dairy. And we can inject manure straight into the ground, which reduces odor, increases nitrogen uptake. What was the other? And reduces reduces our compaction. It also lets us get about what was it? A million to a million gallons of manure pumped out in a day, which is super efficient for us and helps us uh, get a quick crop turnaround uh, for our double crop stuff, which I'll get into here right now, I guess. Yeah, if you want to, Luke. I'm gonna switch over to Luke here. So I do a lot of our manure management here at the farm, um, kind of in charge of everything. Part of the sustainability aspect of that, um, all of our fields, all of our crop ground, we actually soil sample uh, every couple of years and we figure out exactly what the soil needs. And then we're required by the government to sample all of our manure two times a year. So we pull those manure samples and then those soil samples. And we work with a third party company who all, all they do is nutrient management. And they take both of those numbers, the numbers that the crops need and the numbers from the manure. And they give us exactly how much of what manure we can put on all of our fields. So Chase talked about some of our different types of manure that solid manure has a higher organic content, organic matter content. So your fields that might be lacking in organic matter, we try to get that onto those fields. But then the liquid manure, we can put more onto our growing crops. Uh, you don't necessarily want to put that heavy solid manure on the growing crops. So we work with all of that trying to, to be sustainable in that aspect. I'll switch back to Chase. Oh, I can, yeah. So. Um, so here at the farm, we grow corn and alfalfa primarily. And that's what we use to feed the livestock. And then here on the ground close to the dairy, we also grow triticale. And this year we're starting to grow rye. And um, that allows us to double crop. So we're, we're basically planting two crops on the same acre. And um, that triticale or rye is planted this time of the year. We're doing that, broadcasting that on, and then just working it in lightly that'll grow over the winter and then we'll harvest that in the spring and then we'll hurry up and spread manure and get our corn planted then behind that and then uh, so that's allowing more nutrient uptake from the same acre and giving us more crop volume off of the same acres uh, than our alfalfa our and the other corns on all of our other acres uh, we grow a little bit of wheat and some soybeans also for feed Okay, back to me. So some of the other things we have, and I, I'm sure you probably took witnesses as you're coming down, we have some of our equipment around here, which is uh, a big part of how we're able to uh, keep everything moving uh, quite efficiently. Um, so there's a thousand cows up here. Uh, this year we harvested roughly, what, 12,000, 14,000 tons, 14,000 tons of corn silage. Um, so typically if, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen how the Amish do it, but, uh, they have a binder machine basically. And all they do is they cut the stalks down, they pile it up on a cart. They take that pile of corn stalks back to the silo and then they chop it up when they get back to the silo. And it takes them a long time to harvest all that corn. And we went over 600 acres. 600 acres of ground um, fairly quickly. Probably if we had to do from start to finish, it probably took us a week and a half, I would guess, to chop all that corn. So some of the sustainable practices we use um, to get all that done effectively is we have some of this really big equipment. So uh, behind you here, we have a truck and chopper and uh, that chopper is uh, bread and butter of how we harvest the majority of the crops here. Um, using We use it uh, in alfalfa to, to chop that all up. We put it in a bunk silo. And then uh, during the fall here, we used it um, this year for the first time, we actually made snaplage, which is just the ear of the corn. Uh, we picked that off, ran through the chopper and also put that in a bunk silo. 
And then uh, we also chopped the whole stock, just like I was explaining with the Amish there, um, with that uh, head that's on it currently. Um, so that spends a lot of time in the field. Um, and then when we go to manure hauling and all that stuff, we've upgraded our tanks uh, significantly here the last couple of years. And also we've been talking about the drag line. Um, that helps us move a lot of manure efficiently. Um, that tractor there uh, actually can do 43 miles an hour down the road. And that tank will hold uh, 7,000 gallons of manure. And then a typical day, Luke, what, you're doing 25 loads? So 300... Yeah, 350,000 gallons a day, which uh, means a lot uh, when you're working inside of, uh, you know, short time windows. And if uh, it's raining a lot or you don't have the best of weather, if you have one day to get something done, uh, we're trying to get it done as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, that big tractor back there um, with that piece of tillage equipment on there, that is a uh, accelerator uh does uh very little soil disturbance um it does move stuff around but that's how we actually plant all of our triticale and that's how we planted our wheat this year so when luke was saying we just broadcast it on and then just uh they'll broadcast it on and then all we have to do is drive over it once and that basically makes our seed to soil contact and uh it'll grow through the winter and next year we'll start the process all over again with the chopper um so yeah with that that's uh basically what we have for our spiel do you guys have any questions on what yes oh yes rain yeah the guy behind you actually jamie he's our sand man um for lack of a better term he's a sand man and yes rain is a huge factor and we've actually talked about like putting roofs up and stuff like that to try and reduce that but uh what we like to do is you know if we have a window of opportunity um jamie works really hard to try and get things out and we actually have uh you can't see it right now but we have an actual little roller and we roll it back and forth so uh, if we know rain's coming uh you'll see jamie out here miguel and the guys will all be rolling the sand back and forth and uh, we pray for sun and wind well yeah and i guess i guess uh for the sand drying as well um we actually have a way to test it so what we'll do is we'll take a sample of it uh we stick it in a microwave uh, we, we weigh the sample first and then we'll microwave it get it dry put it back on the scale and then we have a percentage of moisture so what we typically are shooting for is a 90 percent dry matter or drier is the goal um it doesn't always happen but that seems to be our happy spot for for what the cows like any other questions? Are any of you guys looking to get into something like this when you're done high school, college, all that stuff? Oh, Luke was just asking if, if anybody here had come from a farm or had any farming background or do you guys show animals or yeah oh okay okay nice and then i guess do any of you aspire to do you know something like this or just be involved in agriculture in general or you know and what what is that what what do you want to do maybe Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody from this side of the group? Because this side of the group is being pretty quiet. Okay. Okay. How do how how do I do that? Oh, are there any questions virtually? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah any question anyone have any questions virtually we i we would love we actually did have a question they were wondering how much does that big tractor behind you cost or something like that big big type of equipment cost to be able to run the farm um it does uh just so you guys know because i'm the only one that can hear this they wanted to know how much that tractor 
Uh, the one, the one with the tank on it, or uh, the whichever the red one. I I missed which the red. One. Oh, the red one. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, sky's the limit. Uh, it depends on what brand you have, um, and you know what you're doing. But yeah, the the cost of equipment is not cheap. I would I would say I mean that that tractor there is a twenty. 13 so it's been around for a little while now um if i had to guess what it is on fast line right at the moment tractor house i would say that tractor is probably worth 150 to 200 thousand dollars and the piece of tillage equipment that's behind it is probably um well probably more like 110 because the market's a little wonky with equipment but yes uh the cost of equipment is not cheap but uh the way we look at it is, uh, you're, you know, you're you're paying it back every time you take a pass over a field, or you save yourself a little bit of fuel doing something. So that's why we have um, here at this farm. We're lucky we get to have a little bit bigger equipment and uh, or toys, and uh, you know, get things done a little more uh, quickly and efficiently. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions, virtually or in person? We'll probably have a couple of questions virtually, but we'll let you wrap it up in person first, and then we'll ask you some questions. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm basically, I'm at the questions thing because I, I wanted to have a dialogue, you know, kind oh, of sure. a little bit, you know, you can hear me talk all you want, but you know, I want to open it up because you guys probably have something on your head. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you can see them. I don't know if you can get a hold of them. Yeah. Oh, uh, she was wondering if she could see the cats. And yes, we do have cats on the farm. Um, they are a part of our kind of ecosystem here. Um, they are, you know, they're they're in it for the milk. And also, if uh, we do have a couple little rodents that like to uh, make them make themselves home in the trenches and around the grain bins, but they seem to take care of them as well. So any virtual questions? Because he oh oh we got a live one. Like what I do here. So she wanted to know what I do here. So I uh I am the sh shop manager. Um so I speak for the machines for the machines have no tongue. Um so basically I, I take care of the equipment. I, I work on barns. Um, this is my service truck that I drive around and try and fix things as they come. But uh, yeah, I work, uh, I work a lot with the vendors, the equipment vendors and things like that. So if there's things that I cannot repair, um, I will you know line it up to have it happen. But uh, I do a lot of welding here, um, mechanic work. Uh, yesterday, we had a little bit of a plumbing incident. We had to dig up a manure pipe and put that back together. Uh, right now we're actually digging a water line for a calf barn. Uh, so I was part of that yesterday. Um, uh, so basically anything under the sun that has to do with equipment or barns or um, fans. And then also, you know, on the cow end, if uh, these guys need to help, uh, we have an on-call schedule. So if uh, overnight these guys have a problem, have down cow or something like that, and they can't they can't handle it they'll call us in and so we had to, so for me i had to be versed in the machine crop and the cow side um so that everything kind of drives so a little bit of everything a question from virtual and you yeah. were just talking about all of the different things you do what kind of schooling or training did you need to have to get this kind of job so i did uh uh so what she asked me what, what kind of school were or training uh, that I had. So I uh, graduated from high school. Uh, I went to Penn State University main campus and I graduated with a degree in ag science and a minor in ASM, which is ag systems management, um, which is basically a, a uh, version of ag engineering. So uh, I wouldn't say my training came from that. I actually grew up on a dairy farm. So I, I, I've, you know, done this my entire life. Um, some of the mechanical skills has just been learned from being around people and um, some of the other jobs that I've had uh, was working on equipment. I actually did 
New Holland Harvest Support. I traveled all over the United States. I uh, went to Germany and stuff like that, worked on combines for a while. And then, um, but basically, uh, most of my mechanical training was uh, just listening to uh, different shops that I was in and uh, uh, older folk, as you would say, um, they have a lot to offer. They know a lot of things. And if you're willing to sit down and listen to them, they will gladly teach you um, anything you would like to know. So, and then it's just uh, repetition, really. It's just, you have to get your hands dirty and keep on doing it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Do you still have your group in person with you? Yeah, we still, yeah, we still do. Yeah. All right. Um, we would love to know what your favorite part of your job is. Favorite part of my job? Yeah, of your job. I, I, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> they, they want to know what my favorite part of my job is. Um, it's hard to say. I, I, I don't, I've done this, you know, farming has been a part of me for a long time. So a favorite part. I guess when everything uh, goes successfully. So when we're doing harvest, um, you know, my big scheme is to have everything kind of uh, ready to rock and roll. Um, so if we get through, um, you know, a cutting or silage and we don't have any major mechanical malfunctions or if there's something that is broke and I can fix it real quick, um, I guess getting that win is my favorite thing um, yeah. because there's, yeah, so that's probably my favorite thing. That's awesome. Thank you to both of you for joining yes. us today. We appreciate it. And we're going to go hop over to the next group. Thank you. All right. Thank you.